again, and we're um, up to part two. You see your calling, and um, I've been reading the scriptures quite happily this this week, even though I've been really busy at school, and um, I enjoyed reading the scriptures and seeing all sorts of things unfold. We had a knock on the door yesterday from a Jehovah's Witness, and that uh, was quite an interesting little visit. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time and for this fellowship lord that we pray you'd bless it and guide it as we open up the scriptures and as we are obedient to thy word in christ's name we pray amen okay you see you're calling now i was told by my wife do not run rabbit trails at the beginning so that means i can run rabbit trails at the end <laughs> Well, what she really means is don't repeat stuff too much because you need to get on and do the stuff that, uh, you know, I said I'd do. So that's true. And basically the strength of what we said last time um, was the fact that there are all sorts of callings in the Bible. Just go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I want you to see this and see how really strong a statement this is. See if you agree with me that this is a massively strong statement that Paul gives to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll read from verse 8, 2 Timothy 1 verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. To me, as I read that, that is a massively powerful statement and one which is extremely distinctive. It separates uh, the calling off, this particular calling off from all other callings. It says, uh, who hath saved us. Well, that's wonderful. And called us. Saved us and called us. I believe and I believe. You know, this, there's something going on here which people have missed out on. And it has to do with this distinctive calling, the distinctive ministry uh, that was given to Paul the prisoner. And we're happy to know something about it. Now, I want you to, to, to go somewhere else now. Go to the book of Matthew, and this is uh, chapter number 20. Matthew 20, <clears throat> um, and verse, well, let's read from verse 1, but I won't read this whole passage, but I'll give you some sort of idea about it. Uh, Matthew 20 and verse 1 says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So he goes out early and he gets some laborers. And it says in verse 2, And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day. Man, a penny a day. Um, it says he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And so it goes on. You can read the account. And he brings all these other workers in at various times. He brings these workers in. They all get paid a penny. And, and then it says um, in verse 12, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. This is a complaint that's brought by some of the laborers because they had come in early and they had been sweating through the Oklahoma midday, you know, out there in the sun. And these other people who come in at near the end of the day when it's cooler and it's more shady, and they get paid the same money. And there's this complaint. Um, it says this in verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not thou agree with me for a penny? Didn't you agree? That I pay you a penny for the work you did? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto to this last even as unto thee. I will. I will do it. 
I have the right to do it. It's legally right for me to do it, and I will do it. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Because you see that there is goodness in what's being done here. You know, you're, you're giving something to a person because of your own generosity. The other people agreed to it beforehand and they get paid. That's what you agreed to. So the last shall be first and the first last. And then it says, for many be called but few chosen. And that's part of the, the thing that I want you to, to think about. So here you've got the vineyard and you've got v various laborers coming in. They're coming in at various times of the day. Some early, some midday, some later on. But whatever, they are paid the same. Many are called, many are called, but few are chosen. The ones that are chosen are the ones that get the penny and they didn't work as much. But they all get entry, right? Then they all get paid. But few are chosen, many are called. Okay, well that's the picture. Now I want you to see something else. Go across to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 14 or thereabouts. Um, that's the portion of scripture I want to finally make your eyes rest upon. But this has to do here with going into the highways and the byways like verse 9. Go ye therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So this is, you know, bidding these people from the highways and the byways to the marriage. And so that those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests, both bad and good. Mm, it's interesting how you, that expression goes, bad and good. Do you want to say good and bad? I don't know. To me, I usually want to say good and bad. But it's inter interesting. It, catched, it caught my eye. It says bad and good and the wedding was furnished with guests and when the king came in to see the guests he saw there, there a man which had not on a wedding garment oh this is a wedding garment and he saith unto him friend how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment and he was speechless then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. And this has to do with this marriage supper. This going out in the highways, and this calling. You notice how it says bad and good. In the verse 14 it says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen would correspond with the good. Few are chosen. But this is in a, a context here of a particular calling. It's, it's not strictly about salvation. It's about a calling and a, a realization of a hope. In this case, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Very interesting here. Very interesting things going on. I'll just diagram that one. So you've got here, many called, and then few chosen. Few chosen. Many called, few chosen. Great. Well, that's nice. Now go across to another passage with me. We're, getting, we're going to get you thinking here. You're going to have to put your thinking caps on. Romans chapter number 8. This is a great chapter. Um... I asked this Jehovah's Witness guy um, whether he was certain that he would have eternal life. And I put it into terms that he would understand. I said, would, are you certain that you would gain a resurrection to eternal life? And he says, no, no one can, no one can know that. You know, no one can know that. I'm trying to endure to the end. And he quoted Matthew 24. You know, he's trying to endure to the end. And I was trying to point out to him 
a very simple idea. And uh, the best thing to do is always go for the simple thing. Is salvation a gift or is a reward? And he says it's a gift. And I say, well, what's the difference between a gift and a reward? And he agreed with me that a reward is something you needed to earn and the gift was free. So salvation is free, but you're saying you're going to have to endure to receive it. Isn't that working? Don't you have to work then if you're going to endure to the end? And we talked a bit about this. Have a look at Romans chapter 8. And this passage is another passage you can, you can take people to, which talks a bit about this idea of security. Security. Now, I believe we are totally secure in the beloved, that we are saved, we have eternal life as a gift, and we cannot lose it. Well, it doesn't make any sense to lose it because we didn't receive it on the basis of our goodness. We received it because it's a gift. So if we lost it, on what basis are we going to get it back? <laughs> you see? It would mean that you'd have to earn it. Well, then it's a contradiction. So here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, a famous passage, and we know that all things work together for good to them that, are loved, that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The called. Now here goes something very interesting to me. For whom he did foreknow. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. And it doesn't stop there, but I want you to see that there is this logical connection. For whom he did foreknow, he also. So this chain of events applies to the person that is foreknown. Okay, so it starts with the person that's foreknown. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He did predestinate this to occur. The predestination means that he's marked off boundaries where things are to happen. And they're supposed to happen within these boundaries. He's made these boundaries. He did predestinate. He set these boundaries up to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the, this word predestination, which has to do with marking out boundaries, relates to the wish and the idea that people, as long as they work within these boundaries and conform to these boundaries, will also conform to the image of his Son. And in so doing, Christ would realize the fact of his being firstborn among many brethren. So what does it mean to be firstborn? Well, to be firstborn, there's a Greek word that goes with this, prototokos, means that he becomes the chief inheritor. The chief inheritor. The firstborn was the chief inheritor. Now, this is not primarily my subject, but I'm trying to get you to see this chain of events that's going on here, which is kind of interesting. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn, that is the chief inheritor. You see, there is a church mentioned in the book of Hebrews, and when we got time we may go there, but it talks about the church of the firstborn. And this is related to this New Jerusalem, which is uh, uh, the result of people being obedient to his call and, and overcoming. And it says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he did predestinate. Oh, so he's moving on this chain. It starts off with those he foreknew, then he also did predestinate. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. All the same group. Those who were foreknown, all this, these things flow on. They just flow right on. And then it goes on and says, What shall we say then? Say, say to these things, If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. 
all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, those whom he foreknew, he also did all these things. And that group is the elect. Here is a beautiful evidence of the security of the believer. Because if you're in that group, you've got that security. No one can take that away from you. In fact, as you read down further, it says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tri tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, if that's not security, I don't know what security is. Right? No one can separate us from. That is a statement of doctrine. Okay, so there is a, a doctrinal passage which relates to resurrection. And it's given to us by grace. And you'll notice, notice there is calling here. He gives a call. The message will go out. Maybe in the time of the book of Acts it will go out in a way which is truly miraculous. In this age, it'll go out through a minister of the gospel, or maybe literature. Maybe there'll be a tract or something else. Maybe a videotape. Maybe on the internet, people will click on something, and there's the message of the gospel will come to them. They'll have a calling. They'll hear this calling. And doctrinally, they'll hear the, the salvation by grace message, and they will respond to it. And if they respond to it, then they were foreknown and that chain of things would apply to them. And that's a wonderful truth. But didn't we read in 2 Timothy and 1 verse 9 that there is a holy calling? And isn't it also true that when the Apostle Paul went and preached that he did so, that people would hear that message of salvation and also know that salvation which came with eternal glory. That's also what he wanted to, to happen. Now I want you to go somewhere else with me, which is um, to the book of Ephesians and chapter number 1. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about a calling. Yes, there is certainly a calling that relates to this whole business of salvation and we need to be involved with perpetuating that calling. We need to preach the gospel of your salvation. Let's go across to Ephesians with me, chapter number 1, and verse 13. It's, uh, we'll read a little bit further back up here, um, and verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, this is familiar territory. Here we have nice straight doctrine about salvation. The gospel of your salvation. Great. Wonderful. Things to do with security and everything else. Great. It's all a part of that. But there's something else in here that we need to be concerned with. Go to Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Look at this. Just as there is salvation and a predestination which is associated with that and there's a calling, so there is here with the inheritance. Look at chapter 1 verse 5. Having predestinated us, marked off boundaries, uh, unto the adoption, we of the seer, to place as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Look at verse 11. It says this, In whom also 
we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. Because there is this predestination set up, this marking out of boundaries, there is a necessarily a call, the gospel. A gospel is being presented to you. And it's the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you're going to either say no to that or yes to that. Does that affect your doctrinal salvation by grace? Of course not. No one can separate you from that love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That can't be separated. But my friends, you can say no to the gospel of the unsearchable riches of Christ. People do it. They say no to that. We don't. And what we are interested in is looking out in the communities around us and around the world to find people who say, yes, I believe that. And then taking them on unto perfection. That's part of what we do. That's, that's what we're interested in doing. Now, people will say, well, uh, how can we best do this? How can we best preach this distinctive ministry? What is the way that we should do it? And I've been thinking about all sorts of ways in which we can do it. You know, it comes down to me to being a personal thing, mainly. Mainly, it's a personal thing that God will bring into your realm, your, the area of influence, people. And when you notice these people, you pass that message on to them. You test the waters and you see where they're at. And who knows, you might find that God will bring into your area of influence someone who say, yes, I understand that, and take them further on. We've got an internet. We've got a web page. We've got messages going out on video. People are responding to that, and we need to take advantage of this. There's something else I want you to um, see. It's in Second Peter. I'm going to take you to something Peter says, because I'm interested in knowing more about how important this election is, and how important is this calling. Um, so go across to the book of Second Peter. Now, Peter was a minister of the circumcision. And what does that mean? That means he had a ministry to the Jews. And 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, it says this, um, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now, he's not speaking to us. He's speaking to the circumcision. But in speaking to the circumcision, he's reminding us also, about this idea of a special calling and election. A calling and election. You see, during the book of Acts, there was certainly a calling that they could listen to. So here's the book of Acts here. So as Acts is running, running through, uh, let's put over here the cross, and then Acts chapter 2 is where the Holy Spirit was given. Let's put down here Acts 9. This is where Paul was called to service in a Christian ministry. And over here is Acts 28, this momentous last chapter where all sorts of wonderful things happen for us Gentiles and in some ways terrible things that happen to the nation of Israel. Because Isaiah 6, 9 and 10 was pronounced for the last time on Israel there. But because of that, certain things came to us the salvation of God was sent to the Gentiles. So in Acts chapter 9, we, we find this occurring. So during this time, during the time of the book of Acts, we know this much. Jew was first. We know that, for example, people would have the faith that Abraham had. And by having the faith that Abraham had, they could be justified. And further, they could be taken on to perfection there also and seeing the fact that, what did Abraham do? Well, he stood in the land of promise as in a strange country and looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So here was, you know, the default, if you like, 
you familiar with this expression, default? The default hope was there. Israel's hope was there. But there was something better that was put forward for people to take hold of, to be an overcomer for. And they could run the race and they could look for this better hope, which was the new Jerusalem, which Paul says in Galatians was mother of us all. They could have that as overcomers and look forward to that. But it would not necessarily mean that they would get there. Would that mean that they were lost? No, of course not. It wouldn't mean that at all. What happened eventually, of course, is that Israel said no to God. And the axe was laid at the foot of the tree and a new hope was presented to the Gentiles. So here's the Gentiles by Paul the prisoner. Paul the prisoner. I'm making up a blog at the moment and it's, it's called uh, Paul and Paul. <laughs> Paul and Paul. You see, the thing about this is, my friends, that the Bible is not a glorified buffet meal. It's not. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. And in rightly dividing the word of truth, you can see that there was a ministry during the book of Acts by Paul to the Jew first, provoking Israel to jealousy. But there's more truth here than that. And when Peter, ministering due the same time to the nation of Israel, he says that they should make their calling and election sure. And this word sure has the idea of a foot. A basis. Making your calling and election sure. A basis. There is a basis for how you can live intelligently in this life. And that is to get your calling and election sure. Get it right. Understanding what your, understand what your calling is. Understand that you're, you've been elected by God. On the basis of his foreknowledge. He, kn he knew you. And your response was, yes, you believed the gospel. You believed the gospel of your salvation. What I'm asking you now is, in internet land, have you trusted on the new gospel given to Paul the prisoner of the unsearchable riches of Christ? Now, what about those unsearchable riches of Christ? The unsearchable. Are they still today unsearchable? Well, they are unsearchable in this sense that if you don't know Paul's ministry, yes, they're unsearchable today. You still won't find them. If your minister is getting up here and he's cranking out the gospel of the kingdom, that's what we're going to preach, the gospel of the kingdom. And all you can see in the Bible is Israel, 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 Jew, Jew, Jew. That's all you can see then, my friends, it is unsearchable in a practical sense. But what Paul is meaning about unsearchable means that you will not find it as a part of the prophets of old. It's not written by them. It's not revealed to them. It was only revealed to Paul the prisoner. And once you get that big opening, there you find it. There the exciting ministry begins. A ministry which I learned about some number of years ago and since then I've only got more and more excited about and by the way I must say more things are opening up to me there's more in here about this ministry more and more and we need to learn we need to pass this on and be excited about it so I think this is a, a great ministry just one more thing I want to show you um, which you all know of it's in 2 Timothy again 2 Timothy and chapter 2. And it says this um, from verse um, 9. Oh, we read from verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. My gospel. Isn't that interesting? My gospel. Why is Paul getting very specific about things my gospel and he's owning something my gospel it's not just anyone's gospel 
If you want to learn about what's going on today, you've got to go to Paul the prisoner. You've got to go there. You've got to find out about his gospel. And he says this, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Okay, let's, let's wax on that for a second. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Hey, folks, you get in preaching about Paul the prisoner and about his distinctive ministry, you're going to get into trouble. <laughs> you're going to get in some serious trouble. Don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. You will get into trouble. Paul got into serious trouble. And he certainly didn't give up because he says this, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. And I trust on that, man. The word of God will not be bound. People will try and shut you up. They'll try and shut this message up. But the word of God is not bound. You're not going to stop it, man, because it's from God. It's from God. And it says this, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes. This is the passage that I talked about previously. That they may also obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Not just any old salvation. No, no. This is the one with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. There's life. You trust him, then you've got life. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. There's rewards. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Rewards. Yeah, you can lose on, out on rewards. But your life is a gift. And then it says this. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Eternal security. We went to Romans chapter 8, talking about eternal security. Right here, man. Eternal security. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny what he has promised. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right in there, right in this whole subject area about the eternal life which has this, this great glory, so is this whole matter of right division. Right in there about rewards and gift, salvation by grace, there is right division. Right there, right after it, what do we have? But shun profane, verse 16, and vain babblings, for they will increase under more ungodliness. What will result from not rightly dividing word of truth? Profane and vain babblings. And I have to say, man, my experience as a Christian is I suffered a lot of vain babblings. Just homilies that went off. And there was no substance to them. Nothing for my soul to grab a hold of and say, yeah, I got some food for my sustenance. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Gangrene, man. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Paul doesn't mind naming names, man. Just comes out and names these people. For all eternity, these are the gangrenous people. <laughs> Who concerning the truth have erred. What do they do? Well, they fail to rightly divide the word of truth. You want to get gangrene? Then you go against right division. You go against the revelation given to Paul the prisoner. And you're going to get gangrene, man. And look what it says. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some yeah, they will. They'll overthrow the faith of some. But for us who understand something about right division, there's no way Jose, man. There's no way they can come near it. These poor people who come around knocking at doors, trying to push off some watchtower or some awake magazine and try and pull people aside... It's just, it's just water off a duck's back when you understand the book rightly divided. 
It's just water off a duck's back. But for those people who do not know this, they get sucked in. Don't tell me they don't. Because many of these people who are going door to door with these watchtower groups, they were in churches. Holy Spirit churches. You know, Church of God. And all these other churches. And what are they doing now? They're in the watchtower. They've jumped out of the pan and into the fire. Why? How is it possible? Right here in the middle, man. They did not learn to rightly divide the word of truth. I want my son to know this truth. I want all Christians to understand the scriptures rightly divided. And if they did, that's the end of cults. At least cults that are going to do any damage. We may disagree. We still may disagree on this and that and the other. And so various denominations might come. But they're not going to go off following Charles Taze Russell. They're not going to go off following some other group that's going to damn them. You know, serious error. We're not talking about little errors. We're talking about major things where they deny the deity of Christ, when they preach the wrong gospel, when they believe that they've got to try and earn salvation. These are serious things. These are serious things. And I have the right to bring this up. I have the right, according to the scripture. If Paul can say these things right here, I have the right to say them right here. You know, it's time that the Christian started getting serious about what he knows and believes and exposes this error. And there are some fine people who can show, you know, at least the basics of some of these doctrines, they do a good job of doing it, and we support those people. And we need to, and we need to get busy on it. But hey, in addition to that, we have a very special calling, a special one, which is this one to do with the heavenly places, the revelation of the mystery given to Paul the prisoner. Well, I've blown my time. That's part two. I think I've got a part three coming up. Let's end with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time. We thank Thee for all that we have learned. We pray, Lord, that uh, this church would be blessed as we open the Bible and discover new truths as we, with patience, go through and understand. Pray for each life here. We thank the Lord of those in the fellowship who might be uh, sick, who may have difficulties in all sorts of different ways. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would work in their lives, that we'd be attentive to their needs and uh, considerate. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.